Welcome to this month's Plymouth College Presents. I'm delighted to be joined by one of our newest staff members, Sophie Reynolds, who joined us in September uh, as a graduate assistant. And Sophie has a really interesting story to tell about her, her journey in football. She's now playing for Plymouth Argyle Ladies, um, but she also went out to America on a university scholarship, um, which is perhaps the route that some people might be interested in. So, Sophie, thank you very much for joining us. Um, as a starting point, could you just tell us a little bit about your journey so far and, and how you've come to be where you are and your, your time in football, perhaps? Yeah, um, so I was kind of always the kid in school that took part in every single sport, so whether that be hockey, netball, everything. Uh, but I started playing football around five because um, I was watching my brother play um, every weekend and then kind of just joined the club that he was at. And from there on, just kind of continued it. It was always my main sport, but I took part in a lot of other things as well. And then um, about 15, 16, I decided that I wanted to go to America and go to university. So um, I ended up getting a scholarship, and then that's kind of how I ended up there. And then when I moved back here um, a few months back, that's when I joined up. Tell us about, a bit about America, because that must be an amazing experience in terms of the balance of student and athlete, which perhaps we don't get in England, and, and, and the whole process of, of getting involved in sport in America. Yeah, so they're really big on, um, obviously, their sport there. Um, a lot of university students, the only, the only way they can afford to go or go to university is by playing a sport. So um, the, all professors and everything kind of understand that, and they know that a lot of kids actually are only there because of their sport. So... Uh, professors would be really lenient on you missing classes and stuff because there'd be days where we would be gone for three, four days at a time away for games. We had to travel. Like, I think the furthest journey I took was we, it took us 16 hours to get to a game. <laughs> so we had to leave like three days before. Um, so, yeah, they kind of understand that you can do your work pretty much anywhere. So I think for them, a lot of the time, the whole virtual stuff going on now, they were kind of already used to that because of all their athletes. So. And, and where were you in America, just for those who, who don't know? Um, so I actually ended up being at two universities. So my first one was Central Methodist University, which is in Missouri, which is like the Midwest, the middle of nowhere, like no one's really ever heard of it. And then I transferred my third year um, to middle Georgia State, so it's down south in Georgia. And just in terms of the, the whole experience, how did you end up going to America? Because for lots of people watching this, that might be something they've never really thought about or perhaps something they have thought about, but I haven't really got any idea how you even start that process. Um, and that was kind of how I was. Um, I just kind of had a dream. I was like, I want to go to America. Didn't say anything to anyone, not my parents. Just kind of went online, searched it. Um, my brother's, one of my brother's friends that he used to play football with had actually gone. So that kind of inspired me to do it. And um, I just found an agency online. They were called First Point USA. And um, I kind of sent them like an application just saying who I'd played with and what I was doing. And then um, they invited me down for a trial in London. So that was the point that I was like, okay, I probably need to tell my parents. So I told my mom and she took me down to London, tried out, and then um, they were like, yeah, definitely, you'll be able to get a scholarship. So then kind of just had my, them as an agency, and they kind of showcased me. So. What sort of, and obviously people watching this, you might be interested in going to, to America. We have an agency that we have used in the past. What sort of age did you start making those decisions about, I really want to do this? Was it, was it when you started the sixth form, or was it before then? It was before then. So when I was in school, I went to... A different school for sixth form and up to year 11 so it was I was already at the one school in year 11 and I just kind of thought I'd seen my brother and sister go to university I'd seen the way they were with sport because my brother was a big rugby player um, and I was just like I don't I don't think that's quite what I want and realized that in America their sport was so big at university that that was my point about okay. 15 so for people who are watching you, you'd recommend getting on with that early and having a look and, and doing a bit of research about you know what's out there maybe because yeah. presumably you had to do things like your SATs as well did you and some slightly different entrance exams yeah so I did my SATs I actually did them twice because um, you, if you don't get the best score on the first time you can do them again um, and then also 
um, you have to put like a highlight video together of you playing or what kind of ever sport or that kind of thing that you want to do. Um, and I guess the more footage you get, the better you're going to look. So um, that took quite a while. And then also just the process of talking to different universities. Because I ended up talking to probably 15, 20 different universities that were all interested but would offer different things, had different majors, all that kind of thing. So yeah, I'd definitely say the earlier the better. At what point did you make your final decision? So you obviously started processing like year 10, let's say, under sort of 15 years of age, year 10, year 11. At what point did you make a commitment to a university? Was that in your upper sixth year? Yeah. So it so, did take that period of time? Yeah, so upper sixth, but I would even say it wasn't till the April time and I was leaving in the August. So then it meant that that process of getting, because you can't get your visa sorted until you've got... Um, a confirmation from the university saying yes we've accepted her she's attending for you to then get your visa so you have to go for an interview there down the embassy then you have to get like so we I had to have an emergency visa appointment um, and then they had to like fast track my passport to get back to me so it was all quite crazy because it was only like a three month period to be able to get it done so so, so yeah that bit of advice you've given us there about if, if you're interested in going to America maybe talk to Sophie, but um, more importantly than that, start early, get that process going because it does take a while and it's taken you almost, well, three years by the sound of it from first looking to actually getting to a point where you're ready to go and, and if you leave it too late, you, you might be yeah. stuck. and like, because uh, some people would go visit the universities, I didn't, but I found like I got quite a good feel of it because I watched like their virtual tours and all that kind of thing, but um, I talked to the coach for like months before I even committed to his team, so... It's a bit different, whereas university here, you can go look at it a couple of times before you make your choice, if you like, whereas I didn't get that option. So the more time you get, the better, really. Uh, amazing. And just in terms of your journey and your sport, because um, women's football is certainly a, a growing market significantly, certainly in the time that, in the last five years or so, the, the, the changes we've seen have been brilliant for the women's game, and it's still nowhere near as... Um, equal perhaps as funding and things are in the men's game but it, it's moving in the right direction talk to us about being a young lady growing up in a time when perhaps it wasn't quite so equal what was that like how challenging was that um it was quite challenging um we i would be the girl that was the girl that played football everyone kind of knew who i was um in the league that i played in because i was in a boys team um i was the only girl in the league i think i was the only girl in like all the leagues around as well so I was the whole of Warwickshire I was literally known as the girl that played football like that's who I was so um and then, a superhero. yeah and then going to school like everyone like on the school field I'd be the only girl playing so it just but I got used to it that was from about the age of five so all growing up I was always that person did you experience any kind of negativity towards that was everyone pretty pretty good about it and just cracked on most people were really good about it other than like if you tackled a boy they'd be like oh you've got tackled by a girl that kind of thing but all of the parents the boys parents were amazing I'd be at like a game away and other parents would speak to my parents and be like it's so great to see her playing so like most of them would say I was better than half the boys too so I didn't stand out as being like a girl that was really bad at football I just fit in so in terms of the uh, like the infrastructure that it was perhaps well no perhaps the support was there but the infrastructure might not have been in place that is there now because yeah. a lot of young ladies who are playing at a good level will be playing women's football now or aiming to end up in the WSL or, or playing for Argyle and teams like that and, and and that's the journey you've been on but you perhaps have gone about it in a slightly different way to some people because there wasn't that infrastructure for yeah. women's football. So I now look at some of the girls that I play with at Argyle because mm -hmm. we've got a few like sixteen year olds yeah. that have come through. But they, a lot of them have played in girls football since they were like kids, whereas I didn't ha have that. I joined a girls team when I was 11 because I had to, because I was no longer allowed to play with the boys. So, and I didn't actually realise there was a team that wasn't that far away from me, but just because it's not like advertised, you don't always realise that there are more teams closer than you think. But um, yeah, it's definitely different now, like all the different academies, especially like at Argyle, we've got the, the youth academies that are just... We're trying to bring all the players through to the ladies' team now. So. And the, the setup, I'm not in saying at somewhere like Argyle or some of the, the clubs that have a relatively serious women's section is, is, is pretty good now, isn't it? In terms of yeah. what's there, and it's, it's clearly not comparable to the men's game at the moment, but there is a pathway now for young girls who are aspiring to be 
international footballers. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know, like, I obviously, from back home, I wasn't involved in any of the, the youth pathways, but um, just seeing here at Argyle, because we work with some of the youth teams, just trying to, like, show our faces and let them know kind of who we are. But um, there's some girls that are already in the England pathway and that kind of thing, which when I was a kid, I don't ever remember that being that huge of a thing. I know it was around, but because I was very rural, it was always the city kids that got involved in that. But because I was like kind of out in the middle of nowhere, like we did, I didn't know about any of that kind of thing. Okay, so, so it's great to hear actually isn't it, that sport is is changing and recognising that, and perhaps the opportunities now are are opening up for, for young women who, who want to be involved. That's amazing. Just in terms of your sporting journey, is there a most memorable sporting moment that you've got? Something you're most proud of or you look back on and think, that was amazing? Yeah. Um, so, to some people, probably, like, they won't have a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, um, so, in America, you're kind of put in different conferences, um, mainly because of the area that you're in, just so you're not travelling ridiculous hours, even though we still have to. Um, so, my third year at my first so it was my first university my third year I um we so we ended up winning our conference and we were like unbeaten in our conference so that was like a it was like history in the school no one had ever done it so that was probably my biggest memory because it then memory one we went to nationals which I would say not that many because of how many universities are there not that many people actually get the chance to do that so uh, I'd probably say that was my biggest and that must be a pretty cool experience in America with, with everything that surrounds sport, going to a national championships and all the sort of the, the media and the hype that, well, everything in America appears to be hyped up compared to the rest of the world. But in those situations, when you watch that on TV, you just see a huge um, media squam around it, I suppose, and, and a real sort of, it's a really big thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we had all, pretty much all our games filmed, which was cool because then they would live stream them so my family at home got to see me play so even if they didn't come visit me they at least got to see me play out there um so that was always a big thing and it was always like a big social media like it's game day that kind of thing so yeah um and we had uh, when we went to nationals we had like a big banquet with all the players the day before so it was like a, it wasn't just a game it was a big it was like a big i don't know occasion but um yeah america does everything big we had the national anthem before every game like yeah they <laughs> They went for it. They love that kind of thing. They, they do, don't they? Yeah. That's an amazing experience, as you say. Um, just in terms of flipping that, if, if you're prepared to share it with us, is, is there a biggest uh, disappointment or regret maybe you look back on and think, I wish I'd dealt with that differently or I wish I, I hadn't experienced that, that maybe you could share with the people who might be watching? Yeah, so um, at my first university, I end, like started off really well um, and... Um, my first year, second year, played a lot, um, but then I ended up my third year not playing as kind of as much as I wanted to, uh, which mentally was quite draining. You 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 feel like you're putting everything in and you're not like getting out what you think you deserve. Um, so that's kind of the reason I ended up transferring. Um, maybe maybe sticking it out in my final year um, and staying there could have been a better decision. I don't know. Obviously, I wouldn't know unless I did. <laughs> yeah. But um, I ended up transferring. Um, found a great team. Really got along with the coach, which was what my issues kind of were previously. Um, and yeah, so I, it's one of them that's was it the wrong decision? Was it the right decision? Don't really know. But I ended up. It took me um, six months longer to graduate just because of classes. Getting you had to take different classes at different universities, but. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't say it's my biggest regret, but it's one of them that's like, was it the best decision or not? I, I guess, uh, for people watching, it, what you're, the, sort of the story you're telling there is that there are different ways to achieve the same outcome in some senses, and, and if it isn't working for you, don't be afraid to have a look elsewhere and, and see what else might be out there, because you've done that, and it's worked really well for you in the end, and we'll never know whether or not it would have worked out at Missouri, but actually you found a route, a different path, and, and it's, it's worked brilliantly for you, and, that, and that's kind of all that matters in the end, isn't it? It's, it's where you get to, not necessarily how you get there, in, in, in a sense. Um, that's really, really useful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Just in terms of um, your inspiration, who, who, who was it that first inspired you to get involved in, in football, 
Uh, was it a coach? Was it parents? Was it family members? Was it friends? Is there somebody that is your biggest inspiration for, for doing what you do? I mean, if it had been for my brother, I probably would have never got involved in the sport anyway. Um, just because I was at his games every weekend. Um, I wouldn't say he like inspired me, I guess, but he's the one that got me into football. Um, but then also my papa, so my mum's dad, he... Um, huge football fan, absolutely loved it. Um, he was actually disabled, so he wasn't able to play, but absolutely loved it, watched everything on TV. And when I was about seven, he um, took me and my brother to Coventry City. He was actually a big QPR fan, but took me and my brother to Coventry City game, and we ended up having season tickets for like 10 years. Um, and every, every other weekend, we'd spend the day with him, we'd... Yeah, so I think he would probably have been my biggest inspiration. He was also the guy on the sideline in his wheelchair. He'd be, like, speeding up and down <laughs> the sideline wherever I was, like, cheering for me. So, yeah, th um, I think probably he was my biggest inspiration. T two things to pick up on that. One, are you still a Coventry City fan? I mean, it's I'm been tough being a Coventry City fan over the last <laughs> decade, hasn't it? <laughs> I can only sympathise with you uh, being a Coventry City fan over the last decade. Uh, but more importantly than that, it, that story is one about your family, isn't it, in terms of, um, and people watching this will be the same, and I've said it to a few people, did you appreciate at the time quite how much support you required from your family to reach the level you reached? Or did you, a bit like me when I was growing up, perhaps take that a little bit for granted? It's only later in life that you look back and go, I really should have valued the support my family gave me better, more at the time. Definitely, because I, I didn't realise the, the commitment I had made in being in a team that actually meant they had made that commitment too, because I wasn't old enough to drive, I couldn't get to training or games by myself, and I had a, two, a brother and a sister who also did other activities, so yeah, my parents ended up driving here, there and everywhere, and I, yeah, I never, and my grandparents helped out, so I never realised the impact on me wanting to play a sport uh, that it had on the whole family. Uh, uh, that's really important. And the reason for asking that question is because I'd like people who are watching this in our community maybe to just take a moment to appreciate that, the young men and women who might be watching this, that actually you can have all the dreams you want and all the things you want to try and achieve in sport, and that's amazing. But you do need the support of people behind you. Never take for granted the early morning breakfast they cook you or driving you to a fixture or buying you the kit, paying the membership fees, all these little things that, that make it possible. Sometimes when you're young, you don't see them. You just think mum and dad are nagging you again, having a go at you again. But actually, their support is one of the biggest factors in people being successful. So, so I encourage people to yeah. learn from your story and, and never take that for granted, really, is, is, yeah. is a really important message. Especially with America too. They helped me fund my five years out yeah. there. So I would have never, ever even managed to get step foot on a plane if it hadn't been for them. So... Yeah, definitely. Um, what would what would your the best piece of advice you've ever been given be as a as a player or as a well as an individual? It doesn't have to be in sport, I suppose. But the best piece of advice you've ever been given that you could share with us. Okay, so I have one that's to do with football, Go on. and it might be terrible advice to say to like my head of sport. But, <laughs> um, Don't worry about that. I'll keep my ears. <laughs> I'll keep close my ears. But my, I think I'm pretty sure it was my dad that said it to me when I was about seven. And he told me, as a football player, he said, you should never let the player and the ball get past you. And I was like, what do you mean? So he said, well, you either let the ball past you or the player past you. So if the player's got the ball and they're past you, then you might have to take the player down a little bit or you've got to win that ball. And I think that's kind of stuck with me. Um, I kind of teach when I coach, so that's what I teach people, um, but I do obviously say that you know, you've got to do it in an ice way, but it <laughs> might have got me a few yellow cards in my time. But. Do not follow that piece of advice, everybody. <laughs> that is not, not going to advise you here first. But no, you, you, your point is, is a really interesting one about sort of learning to play the game, and, and a lot of us have, a lot of children will say, well, I'm a good footballer because I have lovely skills and I can, I can do this trick or that trick, and actually, and I've learned it, in, it through my journey in hockey as well, that actually... Having the ability to do something is one thing. Learning to play the game is a very different thing. And that's where perhaps your experiences playing with boys when you were growing up yeah. might have been different to perhaps some of the experiences people would have if they're just playing with girls. And, and yeah. there's different contexts for it where looking at your background now, you might go, I'm really pleased I did play with those boys because I learned this. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, I would definitely say, if you compare me to some of the 
girls that maybe have only played with girls are a lot more physical than maybe what they are and that is just because I had to be I was smaller I was slower yeah. I had to be that um, but yeah I, I'd definitely say for what I've learned my best part of my game is the tactical awareness and that's just from watching it on TV so maybe that's a good bit of advice yeah. to people is if sport is the way you want to go forward if football is the game that you want to play you need to be watching it you can't just play it and think oh I'm going to learn by playing you got to watch it you've got to see what the professionals do on the TV and that's what's going to kind of help you as much as anything that's really interesting because I know that other coaches that we've worked with and coaches at the school would, would say about living the game living and breathing the game whether that's hockey netball rugby swimming cricket yeah. football doesn't matter if you want to be successful in something you want to get to the highest level you can You've got to live and breathe that, and that goes down to things like your diet, or you you know, getting an adequate rest, doing the right things when it's when it's not always easy, not on the pitch, off the pitch, doing all those things that make you the person that you are, and that's that's a really key bit of advice, isn't it? Um, what, what are your goals for the future in terms of uh, your football? So you're obviously with Argyle ladies at the moment. Do you have ambitions to play at a higher level, or do you think you're sort of this is the level you're going to play at? And yeah, what, what are your ambitions for the future? Yeah. I think I've probably already hit my peak. Um, <laughs> You're still young. You're still young. I am <laughs> still young. Um, but just in America, it was so intense that injury wise, your body really gets worn down just because it's every day, constant training, playing three games a week, some weeks. Like it, it kind of took its toll on my body a little bit. So I'm kind of still seeing that now playing at Argyle. Um, so, I mean, we play at a very high level as it is at Argyle, um, and I can't really see myself being any higher than that. Um, possibly within the league, a, a higher team. But That's not hard, though, is it at the moment with the way with the form you're in? Is not that right? <laughs> hopefully that'll improve. Hopefully, hopefully, that'll improve. hopefully in the coming year that will improve. Maybe, maybe I don't know. We'll see. But. Um, I also I kind of have a passion for coaching and that kind of thing. So I think looking f a bit further into the future, um, maybe my my dreams, aspirations would be to be coaching at a high level. Um, so, yeah, I'd say maybe playing-wise, I'm at that level where I'm comfortable, I'm, I'm happy, I'm really enjoying it. Um, but, yeah, aspirations would probably be to try and coach at that Amazing, that's, that's a great goal to have, isn't it? Um, when you see Coventry City ladies kicking people every time the, um, someone gets the ball in the future, you'll know that Sophie is oh, coaching yeah, them. She'll be in the dugout, that'll be her fault. Um, but no, that is, it's a really, really interesting idea, isn't it? And sometimes when you move on to a new phase of your life, you've gone from being a student, you're starting to work and take on those professional responsibilities. It's interesting that priorities sometimes change and things like coaching become the option for you going forward and, and we wish you the best of luck in that journey just to finish off if I can one more question um, what is the one thing you would say to young men and women who are watching this um, whether they're in our community or outside of our community just what, what's the one thing you'd say to them about sport and, and being involved whatever their sport is um, that if you've kind of got a dream go for it because I guess I had a dream of going to America but I never actually thought it would happen but unless you put the, the time the effort the work in, have that support system around you, you can do it. And I think a lot of the time, you, other people aren't going to be the one that's like, yeah, you can do it. You've kind of got to believe in yourself and you've just got to go for it. And sometimes you've got to put yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit to really try and achieve that. Um, so, yeah, I definitely say, like, believe in yourself because other people possibly might not. Um, and if you believe in yourself, then you'll be able to kind of get your dreams. Amazing, that's a great message to finish on, isn't it? Um, for people, you know, people won't do it for you. If you want to do it, you've got to do it yourself, whether that's in business or academia or sport or any walk of life, really. Um, Sophie, thank you so much for your time. I, I really appreciate it. It's been great to catch up, and we wish you the best of luck for the rest of the season with Argyle and um, beyond that into the future with your perhaps your coaching aspirations. Um, yeah, it's been great to catch up. Thank you for your time. Thank you.